know, that ties into people also blowing the whistle, like Stanley Kubrick, you know, he making movies, trying to reveal some of this stuff, and then, you know, he's, he suddenly mysteriously dies, you know. This. So there's a lot of... Um, but anyone who's really studied this subject for a long time knows that it's not modern. It doesn't just date from the period of, um, you know, the, the discovery of America or whatever. You know, you, you, you can take it back to England. It's very strange happenings with serial killers there, like uh, the one that jumps to mind, of course, is Peter Sutcliffe. Some of the revelations he made in, in court. He was known as the um, Yorkshire Ripper. You know, I've made a detailed study of, of so many of these kinds of personalities, both in America and in England, and the same refrain. It's almost um, unbelievable how, how common the ref refrain is. Not just about their own psychological upbringing with their parents and so on, but during their spree of crimes. You know, they made me do it. Voices made me do it. Hey, Doc, I'm possessed. Do it. Do it. You liar. What of these mine! The other album sign is gone. Get in the next taxi and just go. Go, 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 go! Don't do it. That's not what we're here for. That's no, not no, what no. we're here for. He signed the record and he was nice. Put the date off and everything. He was kind. But I want to kill him. He's mine. I want him. Help me, devil. Leah. Give me the power to war. Next to left. Do left. Do left. Do left. Do left. Do left. I want to. Oh, God, no. God, no. No, 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 no. Nobody. Nothing! He wasn't phony. He's getting a taxi. You coward, you phony! Taxi and go home. You got your autograph. Go home, frame it, put it on the wall. Put it on the wall! Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. There's no place like home. Go home, go home. They've had this whole run-in with doctors. You know, the Hungerford killing, for instance, the name of the perpetrator escapes me right now, but it's the famous Hungerford case, is blatant mind control. Uh, and the guy having serious problems, uh, committing his crime, maybe within half an hour of having a phone call from his specialist. A bizarre phone call was recorded in which the guy lifts the phone, it's perfectly normal, lifts the phone, puts it down, goes upstairs, gets on his hunting attire, his military fatigues, arms himself to the teeth with all of this, you know, hunting attire, and then goes down, you know, into Hungerford and basically slaughters a lot of people. And then, okay, the normal ubiquitous, he kills himself out of remorse bit at the end. No, he kills himself at the end after the head detective arrives and through a large speaker or through some sort of a bullhorn, coaxes him out. Johnny, come out, give yourself up, you're surrounded. And then you hear a shot. So how do we know that that particular speech from that detective or that chief of police is not loaded with what they call trigger terms? You know, we know it exists in backward masking. We know that codes have been used in the military. Well, you know, language is a communication device. How do we know, not know that in, the, in that speech coded, embedded within that particular speech when they're saying, hey, Johnny, come out, give yourself up, you're surrounded. How do we not know that within that is not some trigger word and then bang, pop, you hear, oh, and then the media will never know. It's another mystery. Nobody will ever come to the, you know, and then the media unleash their story for you. They have their little story and the weeping parents and we had no idea that our son was such a lunatic. No, no, the whole world now knows that he's a mass murdering psychopath, but you didn't know? So, you know, we got we got whole questions there that need to be looked at and investigated. Who are the parents of these people? You know, what, what is all the symbolism about? Are these just, you know, disgruntled people? Oh, there's a lot of disgruntled people in the world. There's a lot of frustrated, jaded teens, but a lot of them don't, you know, get into transams and drive them through, you know, McDonald's windows. A lot of them don't go and buy automatic weapons and murder innocent people, so... People need to wake up and realize this thing is, is so much deeper. And then the history of it. The history of it goes back through the assassins, which was the Islamic, uh, during the Crusades. The Crusaders, the, the Western Crusaders were absolutely stunned you see about how it could be that these Saracens and these Islamic uh, war warriors were so unbelievably ruthless and just so dedicated 
almost had no fear of death. Of course, then they subsequently find out after they've been in the Middle East a while that this is a hashish-based cult. These guys are on the bong before they even get on their horses, and other 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 um, you know drugs, other kinds of mind-altering drugs, disseminated to them by their occult leaders, people of Islamic versions of Freemasonry. And it's a very elaborate story. In fact, you can pick up this story in, uh, I think it was um, the book uh, Conspiranoia. But I'm sure that Jim Keith and others have, have covered this. It's a pretty uh, elaborate story of exactly how the indoctrination process of the Islamic uh, warriors in those days basically boils down to the fact that they condition you to believe you you are an angel, you are serving Allah, and those guys are all the devils, you see, and you killing them is doing great work for Allah and the Prophet. Well, if you're mind controlled into that, you're going to be raging into war and killing and having no problem being very brave and all of that because you're conditioned to believe that there's no such thing as death and even after you die, you're going to be surrounded by wonderful, you know, damsels and angelic forms and all of this. So the Templars, later especially the Crusaders after they had married in with some of these uh, Oriental families and had got uh, picked up a lot of this occult knowledge, started to work it out that, wait a minute, you know, if we could have an army, if we could have agents, if we could have captains and people in our military establishment that had this kind of dedication, you know, we could conquer the world. You see, because remember, England, Britain, you know, is a very small place. Holland, some of the, the old centers of government are, are not particularly big. They don't have large populations. They don't have large armies. They can't compete against the great continents of the world. You know, Alexander the Great found that out. So, but wait a minute, if you, if you have one man who's got the power of ten men because he's been indoctrinated, not only is this chump going to do what you tell him to do, he's also going to be a perfect fighting machine. But it means the removal, does it not, of his normal circuitry of uh, morality. Well, nothing could be easier. Morality, as the philosophers and psychologists have told you, is about paper thin anyway. You only have to say a few choice words to somebody and they've lost their head. So it, nothing could be simpler. And when as these chaps found out, these experimenters, that now we understand is the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, now we understand is the, you know, these uh, Frankfurt School and all of these uh, people of the 20th century, but this thing goes way back through the assassins, through the whole drug cult of the cult of Dionysus, where the mind altering, you know, again, harkens back to something I've said repeatedly in my work is that all those things, all those modalities, all those wonderful spiritual occult practices that have the ability to take your soul up, that have the ability to enlighten you, to inspire you, to, um, sharpen your reason, your critical ability, all those things, every one of them has the equal power in the wrong hands to do the opposite, to take you down. It's the difference between sorcery and magic. Sorcery and magic. Never end talking about this. It's a very, very important concept. And all that you see out there in the world today, especially in the media, and most of even the tinkering around with occult subjects, is a form of sorcery. And I'm not the first to have said that. And that's why there's so much insanity down the line, so much misinterpretation. Because toxic individuals in control of, you know, occult ma information is, is wrong. It's, it's going to go askew very easily. Because we have a vast misunderstanding of what all this means. But without even getting into all of that, you know, the Bible, is the Bible sorcery or is the Bible magic? Is, is it a bit of both? You know, so... It goes back through the assassins, it goes back through these, uh, and not only them, there's been many cults in the Orient. The thuggy is another one to be studying, where we get the word thug. Not only were these people funded and created by British money, by the East India Company, the thuggies were never a problem before the British secret apparatus got there through the East India Company, and wanting to destroy and disempower the native Indians who resisted the infiltration of British elements, they formed a criminal organization, the Thuggy. They funded these, you know, bong-smoking uh, Shiva worshippers or whatever they were, Kelly worshippers, who were no threat to anyone. Nothing more than a simple faction, easily taken care of in the region. Suddenly have thousands and thousands of pounds. They're infiltrated by specialists from Britain, from the East India Company, to start plaguing the region, you see, and causing upheaval and disruption, by which the British government hid behind. The triads, you know, the Tong, I mean, the list is endless. So these, this understanding of, of allegiance and realizing what a fragile, pathetic creature human beings are anyway, to, totally traumatized that it's very easy to just, you know, paint over or, or even completely erase uh, uh, the human sensibility, the human sensibilities of morality and so on. 
and it goes right back into the question of religion as well. Religion is very tied up into this because you're not appealing to man's reason when you're dealing with mind control, that's the first thing. You're dealing to man's irrational self, which is why people like myself are so adamant about developing the reason and developing man's higher you know, levels of consciousness because then there's only chance of being immune to all